Hi everyone, my name is Jorge Aspro. Nice to meet you. Nice to to say hi. Uh, I'm from. I'm speaking to you from uh, Querétaro City, which is at the center of uh, Mexico. So let's get hands on about surveillance capitalism. Uh, this is a course. Uh, a today lecture I thought I taught at Tecnológico de Monterrey at Querétaro campus. Uh, it was around four hours of, of uh, lecture, so I'm going to try to be as concise as possible for this not to become a boring video, okay? But I think you're going to love uh, what we're going to see if you love that topic, okay? So here at the first slide we're seeing uh, Transformers character. I don't know who he is. I just wanted to use Transformers because they have to do a lot with uh, surveillance capitalism schemes uh, so the, the, I have two questions right now on, on screen what do transformers have to do with surveillance capitalism and what is surveillance capitalism really important in the next slide we see a meme that says I think I want to buy something anything and we see in the meme uh, social networks such as Google, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube sort of spying through a uh, closed door and I make a, a question here it says it's funny but it's also wrong why this helps incentivate the, the initial debate and also help, helps calibrate uh, your group small, uh, medium-sized, bigger groups um, usually people at, at this point of the, the lecture, uh, they don't tend to participate a lot, but uh, that's a great way to, to break the ice. It's funny, but it's also wrong. Why? We're going to see the answer um, in the subsequent uh, slides. All right? So I'm going to be addressing four main, four main points. Uh, I'm going to be in, uh, doing an introduction to general ideas of capitalism um, and four variants which are really relevant for this topic uh, how can we relate that to geopolitics if you want to address the, the topic from a social technical uh, international relation uh, politics perspective that's fine and it, it may work for you um also in a more practical sense we're going to be seeing how it affects our daily lives even though we might not have full conscience uh, about it and of course uh what can we do about it and also uh if you want to get deeper into topic um deeper into into this knowledge uh where can you start this is like the basics just the basics of uh where can you start all right so, um, for this lecture, I assigned to my students a reading about history of surveillance capitalism. And this history was um, written, well, it's an article, that it was written by uh, J.B. Foster and Robert McChesney. It was written in 2014, so it's almost eight years uh, from now, we're in 2022. But uh, it's really a fresh topic, it's really a fresh text. So I strongly suggest uh, for you guys to, to read it. I'm going to be um, uh, debriefing just the essential information of this topic. I'm going to read textually what Shoshana Subov has to, has to say about the definition and then I'm going to return to what uh, Foster and McChesney says about it. So, according to Shoshana Zuboff, you can find this definition, like a really straightforward definition in the book, but she's been speaking about this almost like since the 80s without uh, properly addressing the definition as we know, uh, as we know it uh, in the book. So, here it goes. Surveillance capitalism. Uh, it, it has eight exceptions. The first one, a new economic order that claims human experience as a free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. 
Second, a parasitic economic logic in which the production of goods and services is subordinated to a new global architecture of behavioral modification. Third exception, a rogue mutation of capitalism marked by concentrations of wealth, knowledge and power unprecedented in human history. And the fourth and, and last one that I'm going to read right now, it says the foundational framework of a surveillance economy. So Zuboff uh, gives us a pretty straightforward, pretty clear definition of what surveillance capitalism is for her. And it contrasts a little bit with uh, what Foster has to say about it. I'm going to go back into a wider, wider uh, uh, approach through the text that these guys um, published in Monthly Review, that's the name of the magazine, uh, around 2000, uh, 2014, okay? So, uh, as a way of introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm saying the, the, the next. Maybe you have never heard about the construct. Maybe you have, but for some reason you might be unaware of it. But what is for sure, you're not surveillance capitalism free. After World War II, around 1945, the United States came out as a the hegemonic power in the world economy. War became the trigger for the economic recovery. Industrial production grew by 90% and, due to the physical devastated factories worldwide, it supplied around the United States, it supplied around the 60% of the world's commodities. But the government had real concerns about it, a really heated economy. Being too productive economically showed that a strong machinery could do, and the risks it possessed, it posed, I'm sorry, it posed. Production then wasn't the issue, but the markets were the ones who posed a real concern. A permanent warfare state stabilized the system dedicated to the imperial control of world markets and to fighting the Cold War, which came later, around the, the 60s, with the, the Asian Wars. The 1970s so showed the clash between military, corporate and societal perspectives. Each of these means of surplus absorption were to add impetus in different ways to the communications revolution associated with the development of computers, digital technology and of course the internet, uh, which was known as ARPANET. Each needed uh, new forms of surveillance and control. The result was a universalization of surveillance associated with all three areas of this is really important, three areas, militarism and security, like national security. Um, the second one, corporations and the media system, which included uh, all the marketing corporations. And third, the financial industry. So militarism, private corporations and financial industry. The war for state. Was that in 1946 and by military de 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 decree? Yes, military decree. Yes, uh, pronounced by General Dwight D. Eisenhower. All efforts of science and technology should correspond to military development and the general mass consumption. Those two aspects really important. As a consequence and for reducing costs. It is later to be considered this as the origins of the military-industrial complex. Military, civilian scientists, technologists, industry and the universities should be working shoulder by shoulder in the name of freedom and security. To produce such protection, most related activities became secret and in some cases rogue. Analogic surveillance at its finest, and it was already rolling. In 1950, Paul Nitz, director of the Department of State's Policy Planning Staff, was given the leading role in drafting National Security Council Report NSC 68, which established an overall United States geopolitical grand strategy for waging the Cold War and global imperialism. This is extremely important he is speaking about uh, geopolitics and international relations 
If the industry was fully deploy, employed, if, if the industry was fully employed, it could produce guns for international markets, as well as butter and milk for the domestic without suffering a decline in its real standard of living. So that gave the name of uh, the butter and milk um, procedures. You can produce guns as well as milk as well as butter for the domestic and foreign markets. So in the 1950s, the military duplicated its spending. The fight against communism helped perpetuate this idea amongst the population, the, the civilians. To fight for freedom is a necessary evil and spending needs to occur. In 1957, at the beginning of Eisenhower's second term, military spending was around 10% of the United States gross domestic production. I'm going to say it again because it's really important. In 1957, at the beginning of uh, Eisenhower's second term, military spending of the US government was around 10% of United States gross domestic production. It's crazy numbers, right? After all, war is a troublesome business, but marketing strategies help. Inherent in such attempts to police a world empire were two, were two requirements. First, a widespread propaganda campaign to make the empire to appear benevolent, the United States, necessary, essentially democratic, which we know it's not true at all, inherently American, like the, the seal of the United States, right? Second, there is a stick to go with the propaganda carrot, like, like the horse. A heavy reliance on covert intervention in the periphery and domestic surveillance and oppression. The sales effort. The sales effort headquartered in Madison Avenue, the mecca of advertising and the admin, Yes, that's a hint to the TV series called Mad Men. Was to be the main success story of the United States monopoly capitalism in the 1950s and the key means of absorbing economic surplus. Profits by reduction is basically the clever move to give more wages to the general population in order for them to spend more. The more you pay, the more you spend. Uh, or, or the more you get, the more you spend. Uh, the end result was to chain most people to the jobs without improving the real standard of living or position vis-a-vis, -vis, face to face, the means of production. The consumer capitalism. This was possible to, due to the interaction between consumers, agencies and the media. And of course, uh, through consumable goods and services. Marketing evolved quickly in this period of greatest advance in 1950s and into a highly organized system of consumer customer surveillance, uh, targeting propaganda and psychological manipulation of populations. It already started. Workers were conditioned to see themselves as consumers in all their non-working hours. It already happened in the 1950s, remember this. Workers were conditioned to see themselves as consumers in all their non-working hours. Sales effort emerged as the dominant process governing the entire cultural apparatus of monopoly capitalism. Common people learned to spend as fast and as much as the governments, even though almost to no consumers have been in war at all. I mean, uh, people were spending as fast and as much as government were doing, even though they, they didn't need to spend in any extra uh, goods and services. Advertising expenses have to be covered somehow and consumers seem to be the ideal candidates to do so. You have to get the money somewhere, right? Marketing departments came with great ideas. Compete for market share, rise of profit margins and decline of price competition. Product variations and versions, changes in appearance and packaging, planned both physical and psychologi psychological obsolescence, frequent model changes, credit, credit schemes, and so on. Different um, commercial and strategic uh, tactics. 
in the 1960s the two largest spendings oh this is really really important in 19 in the 1960s the two larger spenders in advertising were take note General Motors and Procter & Gamble I'm gonna say it again in the 1960s the two larger spenders in advertising were General Motors and Procter & Gamble the military industrial complex and ARPANET remember the military industrial complex has to do with military private corporation private corporations and universities that's a triage interesting enough in 1957 the former president of Procter & Gamble Neil McEnroy agreed to become Eisenhower's new secretary of defense this is where it's getting interesting from Procter & Gamble to uh, the secretary of defense from selling soap and shampoo to the masses to becoming the most powerful man on earth military speaking that same year, Russia launched, launched Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2, the most advanced rockets known to man up to that point. With high political pressure on their shoulders, McElroy proposed to America's president the launching of a centralized agency for advanced scientific research projects. This is where it gets really weird. Drawing on a board network of uh, on a broad network of scientific talent in university in universities and corporate manufacturing firms all, all across the country, and that's how the Advanced Research Project Ar Agency ARPA, by its acronym, was born in 1958. Of course, who was its first director? Roy Johnson, former vice president of General Electric. So we're speaking about General Motors, General Electric, and Procter and Gamble, which they have up to today, up today, uh, and they had important role in developing uh, surveillance capitalism schemes. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency (ARPA) was quickly shadowed by the creation of the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, most widely known as NASA in the late summer of 1958 and due to the stripping of most of the research and development uh, programs uh, Johnson resigned and before returning to Procter & Gamble McElroy handed ARPA a car planche to develop more military focused programs in those decades, um, they created the foundations of anti-ballistic missile systems, GPS, Internet, just to mention some of uh, technologies we know today as consumers. In the 1990s and early 2000s, they developed technologies of digital surveillance in close alliance with the NSA along with military drone technology. So, military drone technology was developed around the 1980s and put into work uh, as early as in the 1990s. Crazy. The Vietnam War era and domestic surveillance. With it experienced in several wars, for example, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, Cold War, etc. The defense of the free world defense of the free world was incoming cheap uh, and easy for the United States military. Countercultural movements deployed. Such a system of military imperial dominance and capital accumulation naturally created not only its own external enemies but uh, its internal enemies as well. Uh, and by enemies we are understanding that there are all those opposed to capitalism and the welfare state. Uh, hippies for instance like generally speaking right a warfare state thus naturally militates into a surveillance state in order to regain and maintain control in the mid 70s congress started to pull the strings and got the army really really nervous in a desperate move they transferred via arpanet all the intelligence files millions of off-record documentation secret documentation to the national security agency to the nsa 
and later alleged that all data was destroyed which we know by now it wasn't so the first uh, formal transactions that were made through internet were um, related to espionage and surveillance files all right that's crazy uh, for many, this action meant two things. One, the existence and functionality of ARPANET, which was classified and secret at the time, and the dangers that digital surveillance uh, represented for everyone. A very successful surveillance program conducted by the NSA, Army and FBI was the counterintelligence program CON Interpro, by its acronym, uh, it was led by J. Edgar Hoover, former director to FBI, uh, and it imposed specific surveillance to citizens, that's crazy, such as Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Jane Fonda, Mohammad, Muhammad Ali, just to mention a few of the millions and millions of private citizens that were spied. The revelation on the NSA, NSA's project ARPANET together with Coninterpro led to the passage of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, which limited the powers of the federal government to conduct surveillance of United States citizens. But they didn't stop. And of course, it didn't stop with uh, United States citizens. It went with uh, global citizens. As early in, as in 1970, the United States allied with Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand to conduct global and massive surveillance. Very interesting. Financing data mining and cyber war. Under the Ronald Reagan administration, the United States economy started to, started to cool down. Full employment was longer, no longer a reality and obvious problems arose. The so-called war on drugs was a failed program that helped to hit the economy. But it uh, was not as successful as it was expected. As a second act, the administration gave the financial and banking sector a carte blanche, like deregulation, uh, in order to increase the stock exchange operations and with this, to reactivate the economic growth. We're speaking about uh, the 1970s, end, on the end of the 1970s, okay? Um, not only did this help absorb surplus through the grand expenditures on fixed investment and employing, employment in the real economy, but the speculative increase in the value of financial assets increased the wealth of the capitalist class independently from production, resulting in a certain percentage of this increased financial wealth being spent as luxury goods, thereby effectively absorbing surplus and stimulating the economy. So people started to spend on things they, don't, they didn't need, uh, such as luxury goods and commodities. Financing or financialization was spectacularly enhanced by high-speed computer networks which became critical mechanisms for the newly created speculative markets and no small amount of financial chicanery. In 1990, Admiral John Poindexter, form, former Reagan's National Security Advisor, was convicted for five counts of lying to Congress and obstruction, ob obstructing the investigations of congressional committees into Iran-Contra uh, matter, involving the illegal selling to, uh, of arms to Iran as a means of secretly funding the Contras waging war on the Nicaraguan government. In this decade, the computer race was heavily heated, having Companies such as Compaq, AMD, IBM, as Intel are the most, as their most visible uh, competitors and tech producers. NSA needed top-of-the-line technology in order to keep their activities as secretive as possible. Database centers were established, commencing the era of the server clusters. But uh, financialization, encouragement of surveillance capitalism went far deeper. Like advertising and national security, it had 
an insatiable need for data, the, the United States government. Every aspect of personal finance was incorporated into massive data banks and evaluated, and, and it was evaluated in terms of uh, markets and risk, and it was really, really successful. Between 1980 and 1990, the average debt per capita had increased by 30%, meaning the consumers were effectively spending more than their economic capacity allowed. In 2003, conflict of interest arose under the George W. Bush administration. It was found that some of the collected data was being wrongfully used in an online futures trading market speculating on, yes, terrorist attacks. Remember, 9-11 just happened uh, on 2001. So this is where tech companies came to rescue Uncle Sam. Data gathering was posed as invasive, illegal, and dangerous, so there was a great urgency to create new ways of data collecting, such as, of course, digital social networks. In social media companies, each user is tagged with a digital ID and then pro uh, properly categorized, focusing particularly on uh, income, class, spending habits, geographical location, and a lot of etc. This data is then sold to data brokers and later to finance consumers, such as government agencies, credit card issuing companies, retail banks, insurance companies, pharmaceutical, uh, hospitals, and so on. Technology companies have access to the most private information from citizens via their photos, messages, contacts, audios, online and offline activity. It is estimated as of 2014 that a mobile phone has at least 14 ways to compile and share private data to data brokers. In 2011, Barack Obama signed an executive order declaring that the infiltration of financial markets by trans transnational criminal organization constituted a national emergency. Remember, by 2011, Julian Assange was uh, well known, Edward Snowden was relatively well known, and uh, the hacking culture was really, really um, de deploying its its power all, all over or all across um, the internet. Uh, we're almost done with this. The internet and monopoly capital. At the end of the 1980s, ARPANET was dismantled, but quickly in 1990, the World Wide Web was created, leading an astronomical increase in users and the rapid commercialization of the internet. Former intelligence technology was privatized and made available for general consumption. Private internet suppliers, ISPs, had the total control to this technology through deregulation. The financial services were also deregulated in an attempt to feed the financial bubble that was developing. So we have to remember the global crisis that happened in 2007 and 2000 and eight. These elements coalesced into, the, into one of the biggest merger waves in history known as the dot-com or the new economy bubble that happened in as early as in the 2000s. The ongoing concentration of capital was thus given a name boost in the technology and finance sectors lead, leading to even greater levels of monopoly power. The dot-com bubble burst in 2000, but, but by that time a virtual internet cartel had emerged. Despite all the rhetoric of friction-free capitalism by Bill Gates and other uh, tech leaders, I mean, th that was full of bull. By the end of the decade, the internet had come to play a central role in in capital accumulation and the firms that ruled the internet were almost all monopolistic. By 2014, three out of the four largest United States corporations in market valuation were internet monopolies. Companies such as Apple, Google, Microsoft, 
uh, Amazon, for example. The major means of wealth generation on the internet and through proprietary platforms such as apps in, is the surveillance of the population. I'm gonna say it again because it's, that this is like like uh, pretty important information. The major means of wealth generation on the internet and through proprietary platforms such as apps is the surveillance of the population allowing for a handful of firms to reap the lion's share of the gains from the enormous sales effort in the United States economy. The digitalization of surveillance has radically changed the nature of advertising. Under this scheme, privacy is really unexistent. These monopolistic corporate entities readily cooperate with the repressive arm of the state in the form of its military in the form of intelligence and police functions. The result is to enhance enormously the secret national security state relative to the government as a whole. Accountability is a mere mediatic show. Total Information Awareness State Although efforts have been made via Congress, the Total Information Awareness Program relentlessly collect information from the citizens nationwide and across the globe kept going the national security agency the nsa secretly decided to continue it through its private private contractors like tech companies for example the nsa easily persuaded them to carry on with what congress had declared to be a violation of the privacy rights of the american public it remained linked to, it, to the NSA and its overall super secret post 9 11 operation for the domestic surveillance of all American citizens and, in this case, uh, global citizens. What was the objective? To collect all possible data from all the population. All data from all population. Quite a symbol. In 2014, Edward Snowden leaked a lot of private information from CIA, NSA, the Pentagon, and several military-related institutions, and it caused some high-ranked personnel to resign, but the, but the espionage aggressively continued. By the 2010, the espionage industry was strongly shaped by corporations closely related to each other, and from these sectors military technology and finance we move from uh, military private corporations in general and universities to military tech companies and finance uh, companies then major internet and telecommunication corporations join the path and help create prism the digital panopticon that could see everything that happened on and through internet. Some of these uh, tech names are Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Yahoo, Facebook, YouTube, Skype, Amazon, uh, AOL, and so on. Remember, this text was written in 2014, so there was still a lot to come from there until now. 2022. The line between corporate and public sector finally vanished. This is how the Jason Bourne saga becomes outdated and boring. Numerous organizations have been struggling for the free speech and privacy rights in the new surveillance, surveillance capitalism era. The population as a whole, however, has yet to perceive the dangers to democracy in an environment already dominated by, by a political system best characterized as a dollarocracy and now facing a military financial digital complex of unbelievable dimensions data mining every aspect of life and already using these new technological tools for repression of dissident groups Meanwhile, the likelihood of cyber war increases, threatening the entire capitalist system and the United States empire itself. Ironically, the very structure of imperialism that has created security threats. 
the threat of cyber war will be used as a justification for reducing individual rights and non-commercial values online ev even more. It's very economic exploitation of the world population as well as its own has left the United States imperial system open to attack, producing ever greater attempts at control. Last but not least, remember once again this text was based on information written and research uh, up to 2014 and a lot of things have happened between 2014 and 2020. So this is like a general, general uh, summary uh, recap of uh, surveillance capitalism. The, the text is called Surveillance Capitalism, Monopoly Finance Capital, the Military Industrial Complex and the Digital Age. It was written by uh, J.D. Foster and uh, Robert McChesney. You can find it, the, the whole text, uh, for free in monthly review. I'm going to put the link in somewhere in this, uh, in this video. So let's go back to our slides.